before we open the word this morning and, and, and I'll be sharing on evangelism before we do that just let's pray Lord I just pray the Holy Spirit you'd lead me Lord you give me words to speak you'd anoint those words Lord you'd anoint me with your power Lord I pray that you build us up you strengthen the inner man in us Lord, I pray that you clear our ears, our inner ears, that we hear. Oh, Lord, you give us ears to hear and eyes to see in our spirit. That, Lord, those of us who know you, we'd see with greater clarity. And those of us who don't know you, Lord, that you'd give us a revelation that we would, that we would see you, that we would know of your might and your power, we'd know of your glory, we'd know of your care and love for us. We'd know of your care and love for the lost world. We pray that, Lord. Amen. This is the uh, fourth week of a six-week evangelism series. <clears throat> and today it's titled Evangelism, um, Intellectual. Intellectual Evangelism. But first I want to... It was introduced to us... Um, it was said... This is not just to encourage us to share the gospel... It's that we actually might become ones who, in our heart, would desire to share the gospel. Amen. That in our walk, we would actually be looking for opportunity to share about the Lord that we would know. That our mouths wouldn't be shut. That the walls wouldn't be there that we feel we can't penetrate through. But that we would become ones who would be walking with God so that our hearts would be open and we would feel like we are his saints and kings in this kingdom to share his word to share the word out to those around us. And what is that word, that good news? That good news to share. That God has made a way that we might be reconciled to him. That through Jesus Christ, the man Jesus Christ who died and rose again, that through him, mankind might be reconciled to God the Father. That we actually might be changed, that our life, which was a, become just a life on this earth, could become a supernatural life on this earth. The good news is that we might have supernatural life, that that life would continue on past our death forevermore in relationship with God the Father. But that life while on this earth would be in relationship with God the Father, in intimate fellowship with him. That's what he promised and that's the good news. The good news is that even though around us, both in the, in the wider world, but also in our, in our very present world, those close to us, those events close to us, even those who might be in turmoil, that we can live today with a peace in our heart, a peace that surprises understanding, a peace that I really can't explain except I can say, God gave it to me, that when Tragedy happens in our family members and tragedy, unfortunately, does happen. That I can carry a peace in me. I can carry a peace and a hope in me. And I can walk through those circumstances knowing that my Lord has everything in control. That's the good news. And the good news is of a life that's no end, has no end. It's a life of continued fellowship with God now and beyond the death of my mortal body. You see, God, God has made a way through Jesus Christ. And he's, he's, he's forgiven me my sins. He's forgiven them. He's blotted them out. They're gone. He puts them as far away from me as the east is from the west. And he does that by his grace, undeserved by me. But because the man, Jesus Christ, went to the cross as a lamb and died. And God the Father raised him again and seated him on the right hand. And he sits there making intercessions for each one of us every day of our life, every hour of our day. So I'm speaking about this before I get on to intellectual evangelism because I want to lay that foundation of God wants us. I know he wants me. He wants me to be changed. He wants me to have his heart. I just want to turn to Romans 6, 8 to 11. Now, if we have died with Christ, 
we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now Paul's talking to the Romans here, the the Christians in Rome, encouraging them, but speaking to them and saying, you too can be a recipient of Christ Jesus' death. I can be a recipient of Christ Jesus' death, and I am a recipient of his death. Not only that my sins are forgiven, but I've received a whole new life. I've been born again in a supernatural way. My spirit is new. And it's now I can now enter then into the kingdom of heaven. I'm no longer separated from God. I'm no longer, he's no longer a far away. He's no longer not able to enter into his presence, but in in Jesus Christ within me, I can enter right into his presence. In my prayer time, I can enter to him and I can hear his words of comfort back to me. I can hear his leadings to me through his Holy Spirit. Why? Because he has joined us in Christ before him. And that's the God we serve and that's the supernatural thing that happens as we come to know him. And that's the good news. And so this morning I come to tell you on evangelism and I don't come to tell you what you must tell, that you must tell the world. Even though Christ encourages us to tell the world. I'm not to tell you, I'm not here this morning to tell you how to tell the world. There'll be plenty of time for that and other people and there's plenty of books to tell you how to share your faith. I'm really here this morning to not to tell you that if you're not witnessing for God and haven't witnessed for God to somebody over the last week, you should feel guilty and think, oh, shame on me. And then you feel an oppression in your spirit and you don't say anything anyway and your mouth remains blocked. But rather, I want to take you to a place of more intimacy with God. For the greater your intimacy is with God, it is from there that you will find the expression to share him with others. It's when you know him, it's when you experience him, that you will be ready to share with others as Christ shared, with love, with concern, with tears. You see, it was at the beginning of COVID, and what was that, two and a half years ago now, when COVID came along, we had a lockdown. And I was walking down to the beach. The beach was close by my house, and so I was fortunate enough to be able to go out of my house and just walk around along the beach and come home all in lockdown. It was a bit of a holiday. But uh, I was walking down there, and I was saying to God, what's this about? Lord, here we are. I've never been like this before. The whole country, locked down, told to stay at home. What's, what's this about COVID? Fear gripping people's hearts. They're wondering if they were going to get sick and die. What's this about? And I felt God saying that the time's coming for New Zealand when his word will go forth. I don't know what had had to do with COVID so much, but that's what the answer came into my heart, that there was a time coming for his word to go forth. But he also laid in my heart. He said, I want your hearts to be soft. I want your hearts to cry for the lost. I want your hearts to cry for those of New Zealand. And he spoke to me. And my heart, when I looked at it, was somewhat hardened. And I wasn't crying for the lost. I then set to and I rang up a friend of mine who we started to pray each morning. We prayed probably five out of seven days a week through that period. And we're still continuing it today. But I had to confess to him. I said, listen, I'm ringing you up and I'd like us to join in prayer. And we used to pray 30 years ago together. And his question was, why are you ringing me up now. And I said, because I believe God wants to change my heart. He wants to bring a softness in my heart because I don't have a softness in my heart for those around me who are lost. I see them. I walk past them. But I don't cry for them. I'm not prepared to die for them. My heart's hard towards them. And that was the truth. 
I loved God. I came to the church. I preached from this church. And yet when I really looked in my heart, I still saw a hardness that was the God was wanting to break so that I would start to have a softness and that I would speak to them from that softness. See, Christ went like a lamb to the cross. Oh, I can imagine him turning to that woman that touched the hem of his garment. He said, who touched me? But she would not have felt condemned in one bit. She would have felt loved. She would have felt that God was pouring out towards her. And she was made whole. Let's turn to um, Mark 12, 28 30 to 31. And one of the scribes, and one of the scribes came and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, oh, and, and seeing that he answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? And Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord alone is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And there we're seeing the greatest commandment. Love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul and with all our strength. And why, and why am I emphasizing that with evangelism? Because it's out of the love of the Father as we find him and he reveals himself to us that the desire arises in us to share him. The desire arises in us and the ability arises in us to share forth Christ. It's as we come to know God and we start to understand his heart that our heart starts changing to his. And I start to change my hardened heart as I come face to face with him each morning in prayer time, saying, Lord, what would you have me do? Lord, as I pray for these people of New Zealand to soften my heart, and then I start to see his heart, that his heart weeps for New Zealand. His heart weeps. He doesn't rail against our government. He doesn't rail against those who drive their cars into dairies. He doesn't rail against those who commit murder and all forms of other sin. No, no. God's mission is to redeem mankind to himself. And he loves and he cares and he desires that they would come to know him. He doesn't say, I'm going to put them in prison and have them have capital punishment and banish them forever. Now, that might be that the, in the laws of New Zealand, the statutes and there are laws and things happen to people. But God's heart, leaving all that aside, is that they would come to know him. That they would come to know him. And that they would come to know a peace in their heart as the life of Christ comes into them. And he desires that. Jesus came and he didn't pursue his own will. He came and he submitted his life to the Father. And he said, I only do the will of my Father. I only do what my Father has me to do. He went to, we, we, we see him in the Garden of Gethsemane. They say praying so hard as it was if his sweat that came out of it was drops of blood, but he was praying and saying, Lord, Lord. Father, what do you want me to do? And the father was saying to him, I want you to go to the cross. I want you to go without a word across your lips against the Roman soldiers. Don't spit any vial back at them, but go, perfect, to the cross and die so that mankind might be redeemed. And he did. He said, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. He was in obedience but, you know, he didn't go to the cross kicking and screaming and saying, I don't want to go, I don't want to go. Oh, you're making me go. You've commanded me to go, so I suppose I'll go. No, 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 he went willingly because it says the Bible says it saw the joy that was set before him. 
And so he saw the heart of God. And the Father's heart became his heart. See, he was a man just like us. I know we say he's the Son of God, but he was a man, Jesus Christ, just like us. With the same feelings that we have and the same thoughts that we have. But he said, Lord, your will be done. And I'll go because of the joy that is set before me so that mankind might be redeemed unto God the Father through his death. God's primary purpose is the redemption of mankind to himself. That's his primary purpose. It's not the glorifying of the church. He wants the church to be set on a hill and shining forth his glory. But the reason he wants that is so that men and women out there who are lost can be touched and turn and know him. Read Romans 6, 30 to 38 to 40, please. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus is speaking this. He said, I came from heaven, not to do my will, but I came to do the will of the Father who sent me. And this is the will of him, this is the will of the Father who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. Seeing God, the Father gave him the whole world. And he wants to lose none of the whole world. That's his want will. He doesn't want to lose any. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. And I'll raise him up in the last day. We return to the next scribe, and I'll just these are, these are the next verse, please. Next set of scriptures. He also says in Second Peter three to nine, he says the Lord. They were they were they were, they were saying, well, Jesus delays his coming. He can't care about this world. Look at what goes on around this world. Look at the wars here and the destitution there. And the answer from Peter from the Lord was, the Lord is not slow in fulfilling his promise, as some count slowness but is patient towards us, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. See, Christ delays his coming so that people have a chance to repent. And we look at it with our eyes and we think, oh, Lord, what's going on? People are dying. People are being abused. People this, people that. Yet God's will is that they would come to know him. And he wants the church and he wants you and I to be willing and ready to go, and to speak the word as God would speak the word unto them. And again, 1 Timothy chapter 2, and Peter, uh, uh, Paul's writing to Timothy, he says, First of all, I urge that supplication, prayers, and intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for all people, for those that are good and those that are bad, those that do good and those that do bad. Make prayer and supplication for all people. And then he goes on in verse 3. He says, this is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. The desire of God the Father, his heart is that all people would be saved. That's his heart's desire. And he's not, he's not, this is not just a wake up in the morning and I'll think I'll have a thought. Oh, this would be my desire for the day. No, this started right back. In Genesis, the first three, three, three verses of the Bible, or might be the first four verses or five verses in the Bible, are about creation. The rest of it is about the redemption of man unto God. It's about the reconciliation of man unto God. He was so seriously sent his own son to die so that we might have life. He was so serious that he's... He, he's continued that course from then to now, seeking that mankind will turn unto him. And he's chosen us. He's chosen us. He said, my people, come. Let's go and speak that gospel. Let's go and tell that gospel from the mountaintop. Let's speak a word unto New Zealand and they will hear about Jesus Christ and they will hear about him in a way they've never heard before and they will be struck to their core and they will turn and worship him. That's what he's looking for. You, 
you're, most of you have heard of the parable of the, of, of the prodigal, of, of, of the lost sheep. I'll do that one first. Jesus was eating and drinking with sinners and the, and the Pharisees saw him. And he th they thought if he was a righteous, holy man, he shouldn't be sitting with them. He shouldn't be sitting there and eating and drinking with them. So they came unto him and said, how come you're sitting with, sitting with those people? And Jesus answered them. And he told them a parable. And he said, there was a man with a hundred sheep out in the wilderness and one went astray. And he left those 100 sheep, or the 99 of them, because one's gone astray, and he went off and looked for the one that was astray. And he searched for it and he found it, and he put it on his shoulders and carried it back. And he said there was great rejoicing when he found that one. You know, and they looked at him with eyes not comprehending, but they thought, what's he talking about? No good shepherd would leave his 99 sheep in the wilderness and go after one. The wolves would come and get the 99. He'd come back and there'd be a scattered flock. What's he talking about? But Jesus was showing the heart of God. God's heart was so much that he will have his own son sacrificed to save that one lost sheep. No shepherd would do that. No mortal shepherd would say, well, I'll let my family be sacrificed so that I could save a lost sheep. No. It'd be bad enough they wouldn't even leave the sheep in the wilderness. Now, God left the sheep in the wilderness because we know that his protection was over them. But the point of the story was he was showing the heart of God. The heart of God the Father is to go after that one lost sheep, not regardless of the consequences, but regardless of what the cost is, he'll go to the one lost sheep. And it cost him his son, his only son. The heart of God, make no mistake, the heart of God is for mankind to come to know him. It's not to give you a good job, and he might be giving you a good job. It's not to give you a nice family, and you might have a great family. And God will be working in that, but that's not his purpose. His purpose is not to make your life here on earth a great life, but you might have a great life here on earth with God. His purpose is to bring men and women to know him, that they might live with him in eternity. He can be their God and they can be his people. And he wants as many as possible. He wants all mankind. That's his desire. He's cut no one out. That anyone who would believe in him can have eternal life, can have Christ inside and know a peace that surpasses understanding. And through death, death matters no more. It's lost its sting. I continue my relationship with the Father. And beyond death, it just gets stronger because I see him face to face rather than through this mortal body. Why, why do I mention that? Because I want to encourage you and give you hope. I, 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 want, to find, I want you to start finding yourself changing. And I'm not saying you need to be changed. I say to myself, I need to be changed. I shared before in COVID, I need to be changed. I rang this friend up because I knew he had a heart for God. I was praying with him. This was about two weeks into when I started praying with him. I'm on the phone praying with him and he's weeping. And I'm sitting at my end of the phone, cold as a fish. What's he weeping about? He's in the middle of his prayer and he's weeping for this person. He's praying for them. And I'm saying, oh Lord, change my heart. Change my heart that I might have a little tear come out of my heart for that person. Because I was sitting there, not weeping, not weeping. I heard a story, and I'll just share this because it was so, 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 so true. There was a man who was a preacher, and he said he, he was, he said he made a practice of his. And he was, a, he, he was a man who had shared lots on Christ. But he said he made a practice, and he always carried a track around with him. And he said he went to a restaurant. He said he went to a restaurant with an older man in his um, in church, and they were sitting there. And he said it was in my mind that when we left a tip, it was in America. He left the tip. He'd put the track down. So when the waitress came by, she'd get the tip and maybe take the track and read it. He said I was waiting sort of for an opportunity maybe to speak to her. He said I had the track ready. And he said she came up to the table, 
And he said, the old guy that he was with, he looked up at this young lady and he, he said, tears started coming out of his eyes. And he just reached out and took her hand and he said, listen, I just feel to pray for you. Do you mind? And she said, she, she, she said no. And he started to pray and she started to cry. And he said, there I was sitting with my... He was crying and praying for her. And she was sitting there receiving. And he ministered to her and led her to Christ. You see, and the point was he told that story because it's from your heart. It's from the tears of your heart as we see God's heart. As my heart is broken for what his heart is broken for, yeah. then I will minister Christ to others. It's about a minister. It's not about the tract I have. Now, there's nothing wrong with tracts. And tracts are good and tracts have led many people to the Lord. So I'm not, I'm not putting those down. But I'm speaking about that I'm saying this morning that we must have an intimacy with God. And once our intimacy with God grows and once my heart softens and my heart becomes like his heart, then evangelism is something that will be with me 24-7. I'll wake up in the morning and say, Lord, your will be done. Lord, who is at work today that I might speak to? Give me an opportunity to speak to them, Lord. Lord, Holy Spirit, lead me. And give me the words. Show me the opportunity, Lord. Show your, my, your might and power and that I might speak to them and see them changed. That's just one last scripture. It's not down there, but Proverbs 11.30, it says, the fruit of righteousness is a tree of life. Yeah. And whoever... Win souls are wise, is wise. See, the fruit of righteousness in your life will come out as a tree of life. People will look upon you and they will know that you're a tree planted by waters, roots going deep into God, your leaves not withering when, 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 when bad circumstances come, when droughts happen. And they will, need the, they will know that you have a fruit in you and on your branches that lasts in all seasons and is good for all seasons. And he says, and he who wins souls is wise. And what he means by that is that, it's a bit like me saying, if you wear a helmet when you're riding a motorbike fast, you're wise. It's a sensible thing to do. It's a sensible thing to do. Wearing a seatbelt in your car, sensible thing to do. It's the same, same with God. Winning souls, a sensible thing to do. Why? Because that's the heart of God. You've chosen your path is the same path as the path of God the Father. That's why it's wise, because it's the same as his. Anything we do that's the same as God is wise. So I just want to talk a bit about intellectual evangelism. It's a bit of a change of, a change of direction after an encouragement. I hope that encouraged you. I hope it settled in your heart something. Don't feel forced to go and do something first. Look into your inner man and say, Lord, change me. Change me so that I might go forth willingly. Change me so that I might be ready and willing to share. And if I'm not like that, press into God. Oh, spend some time on your knees before God and say, Lord, change me. Lord, bring me so that I might be aligned with your will. Intellectual evangelism, let me first say, I find it a bit of a contradiction in terms. See, a man cannot get saved by intellectual reasoning. A man cannot get saved, nor can a woman. Nobody can get saved by intellectual reasoning. No, we're saved by the grace of God through faith. And faith alone in Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2.8, and I don't know if I have that scripture. If I don't have it, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God. By grace, you have been saved through faith. The faith that God gives you, you've exercised it to grasp hold of him. And it's by his grace he's done that. We had nothing to deserve about us. There was nothing deserving about me, nor nothing deserving about you, if you're saved. It was by the grace of God. But he gave you faith to respond. And you responded. When Peter came out of the upper room and he spoke about that which was prophet, prophesied by Joel, and they were all Jews, so they knew what Joel had prophesied. And they said, how can we believe? 
How, how can we be saved? And he said, believe and repent. How could they believe? Christ gave them faith to believe. He gives us faith to believe. It's all by him. But it's through faith. It's not by reasoning. He didn't say, now go off and do a Bible college and learn about God and you will come to know him and therefore you can be saved. It's not by the reasonings of man that we're saved. It's supernatural. It's by his spirit, by his revelation, and I'm saved. But that's nothing against intellectualism. There's good and bad in that. You see, there's many a person who will give a testimony that they started searching for God through their reasonings, and they found him. And they found him because as they searched, they started to see the, the lies of the world. They started to see that that which God said is true and that which the world says is not true. And through that, they started to search and God revealed himself to them. And then they had a heart experience. For it's our, by, and it's in our heart we are saved. There's an institution of creation research. They put out many good articles. When I got saved, I was 30. I got saved wonderfully. All salvations are wonderful. Mine especially so. Because <laughs> it was me. <laughs> I got saved. But I woke up the next morning and I had a contention within me because I knew God was real. I, I, what happened to me it was I had no doubt God was real. I had no doubt that he'd, he'd spoken to me. I had no doubt that I'd accept him as my saviour. And yet I said, how come? How come the Bible is so different than what I've been taught? I'd been to university. I had a couple of degrees. I'd studied zoology and biology. So I knew the theory of evolution. I knew that it said it was billions of years old. And yet this book was telling me it was not very old. It gave me a genealogy from Adam, the first man right down to Christ, who was not that long ago. I said, what goes on here, Lord? I know you're true, and yet... And so I set two and read. Set two, and it wasn't the institution of creation research in those days. It was some other one. I think they split from that. But, but it was... They put out some articles, and so I started reading them. I started looking into it and saying, Lord, I have to settle this in my heart. I have to settle this, otherwise I will walk as two men in the same body. With my heart believing in my head saying, no, that's foolishness. And I can't survive like that. I have to put it to rest. And so I said, Lord, show me. Show me your word. And, and, and show me why it's true. And so I, would, I did turn to books written by men who explained in their way while I, while, what they saw things that matched up with the Bible. But you see, the it starts really right at the beginning when we think about it. See, on day one, Satan came to Adam and Eve and he didn't speak to their heart. He spoke to the head. Did God say? Did God say? Was it really right what he said? Or was he fooling you? And it was in their mind. And in their mind, they started to believe the deceit. It wasn't in their heart. They believed it in their mind. And it's no different today. You see, the theory of evolution is, didn't come about when Paul was around. It came about much later. But it was given by Satan unto the world, taken up by the universities, preached and now taught in all schools. Well, most schools, 99% of the schools. You might find a few that don't. But most of them teach evolution. And if you go and tell people evolution... It's not true. They'll say, you're foolish. They look at you and they think, you're foolish. My friends think I'm foolish when I say to them, even who are non-Christians. When I say, no, 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 that's not true. Evolution is not true. The world was made as God said it. God said that the earth was made first and in the fourth day he made the stars and put them around the earth. And they'll chortle to themselves and say, oh, you believe that? No, it was a big bang and it went out and the earth formed after that, but the earth formed after the sun. The sun film formed first and then the earth formed and went around the sun. It's not true. God made the earth first. And then he made the stars, the sun and the moon, and then he made the stars. 
How do I know that? Well, I know that by, by when I read the, the Word of God, I know that. And you say, but, but they've got scientific explanations for it. They can contend those scientific explanations till the cows come home, but it won't bring a man closer to Christ. I might be able to show him evidence to say, listen, what you're believing in is a, is a falsehood. And he might start his search. And as he starts his search, then God will meet him. And in his heart, he will come to know the true Lord. You see, on 1 Corinthians 1, I'll just read a couple of these scriptures. For the word of God, of the, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Now you read all that and you go, whoa, I'm not sure what he's quite saying. But God's saying, listen, the wisdom of man is not the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God is far higher than the wisdom of man. If we settle that in our hearts as a number one basis, God's wisdom is always much, much greater than the wisdom of man, no matter what man tells you, no matter what the world tells you. The wisdom of God is far greater. And he says what God, man has done is through their wisdom as they've puffed themselves up and they made their own little gods. And those gods aren't little idols. No, no, these are gods in their mind. These are gods about evolution. Evolution is right and it's true and it trumps all other things. It trumps even, they will tell you, the Bible. And you try to go to any university and get a degree in any one of the sciences and say, no, no, that's not a truth. The truth is the Bible. God's truth and God's way and God knows because he knows everything. They'll laugh you and they will not give you your degree. They'll say, no, you must tell me what we say. You must say, because our way is the world's way and our way is our God's way. They won't call it that, but that's what they're speaking. But he goes on to say in verse 23 there, and we preach Christ crucified. So even though a man has that, Paul says, I come to them and preach a crucified Christ because that is the power of God unto salvation. It's the crucified Christ. It's not me preaching against them, their knowledge. And I'll come to some of that in a minute about what they are knowledge that is truth that's not their knowledge. But it's not me contending with them intellectually and trying to show them the folly of their ways that leads them to Christ. What leads them to Christ is that we preach Christ crucified. For it's the Romans says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. See, we overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, the testimony of Jesus Christ in our life, and the testimony of the good news that has come unto me and I share unto others. And that has a power and a supernatural power to touch the hearts of men. And it can cut through any intellectualism. It can cut through and cause that man like I became saved and yet confused because I had this, whoa, what's going on? God, what's the truth of the matter here? I know you're true. And yet the world's telling me this and my mind is telling me that. And I had to put it to rest. And I had to choose. Do I choose God or choose that? And I had to see it in its falsehood. And God helped me to see it in the falsehood. If we have the next slide, and I'll just, should be a, that's a monarch butterfly. Yeah, this is amazing. If I could just share a little bit on this, and am I an expert in this? No, I'm not. But you don't have to be an expert. You only have to be a small boy, and you know that something's at work that you can't explain. I used to be a small boy that used to find those little things that hang on plants that'd be the little cocoon. And if you got it early enough and you broke it in half to see what was inside it, it was just a mess. It was just a bit of yellow gunk came out. <laughs> That's what would happen. I don't know if any of you have ever done that. 
But you go and get a chrysalis about three days after it's formed on a little branch and you break it open and it's just like somebody's poured a little bit of white soup in there or a little bit of gunky soup in there. And you squeeze it and it all comes out and you think, what happens? And yet you know if you leave it and you watch it, in about three weeks' time, you'll find it'll split and out it'll come there will be a moth or a fantastic butterfly. Whatever, whatever the larvae was that it went into the cocoon. Whatever the caterpillar of that species was that went into the cocoon. An amazing thing happened. You see, it starts off in an egg and then it turns into a caterpillar. And we all know caterpillars. And they eat, they eat, they eat everything. They eat your veggie leaves, they, they eat leaves. And they grow very quickly. If there's one, there'll be ten of them. And they'll be eating the whole leaf up. But caterpillars, they grow they grow fantastically fast. In human terms, if they were a baby, when that baby's about two weeks old, they'd be about eight ton. They grow that fast. They go from this to this. They just go, mo they motor. And they eat. But when they do that, they've got their legs. They've got, I think they've got uh, ten legs, uh, six, six on either side. Twelve legs. We won't get into details of that. But they molt. So they grow a bit bigger and then they shed the outer skin. So inside that outer skin, a new skin forms. And the outer one falls off and they get a bit bigger and stretch out and they start eating again. And that happens, for the monarch butterfly, it happens about four or five times. They have five molts. before. There's all over about a three or four week period as they sit on that plant and eat, 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 eat. And every now and then their body says, make another skin. And inside that skin they make a new one and they push the old one off. And they move on. And I look at that and even that's incomprehensible how that happens. But it's amazing. It happens. And if you know those monarch butterflies, I don't know if it's got the colour there, but they're yellow and black and they've all got intricate markings on it. And every time when it makes the new skin underneath, it doesn't copy the other one, but it makes a new skin. It's got its own colouring. It's all very pretty. And then one day, something inside it tells it to spin a little silk web on the branch. And it spins a little silk web and hooks its back feet into it. And it hangs down. And I think we can see it hanging down there. And it starts to hang there. And then it starts to change. And it goes through, it makes another skin inside it this time. But this side, the skin inside it is not the same as the old one. It's just a green sheath. And you see that over there in the called the pupa stage. It's a green sheath. It's got no legs. It's got nothing. It hasn't got its things that stick out the top of it. it hasn't got a mouth on it. It's just a, it's just a sheath. And that's the one if you get after a couple of days and open it, you'll see it's gunk inside. Because it, it, it puts that there and it sheds off the old skin and it hangs there. And everything that was in it, which was that caterpillar, starts to dis disassemble. All the little cells come apart. Some of the cells actually break down. The cell wall breaks down, the stuff inside the cell spills out, and it's protein, and other cells grab that and add it to them. But you know what? There's an order going on. After about four days, if you cut it open and add a look, you'll find that some cells have organized themselves into a bit of a wing. Other bits, other parts of the wing. And the wing's made up of many, many parts. Some of the harder parts, some of the finer parts, some is just a little, it's not leather, but it's just a little membrane. Others form the genitalia of either a male or a female. Others form the mouth. See, a caterpillar chomped away at leaves. Butterflies don't, not monarch butterflies. They, 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 they taste the nectar in plants. So they're, 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 what they now develop is something completely different, but in its intricacy, Allowing that, allowing that moth, a butterfly, when it, when it develops and comes out of that chrysalis, that is fully functioning. And something told it to do that. And I can tell you, without a shadow of a doubt, there's no way there ever chance that ever happened through evolution. There's no way that happened by chance. The intricacies of going from a caterpillar to a monarch butterfly by those cells all going into a little soup and then reorganizing themselves and coming out of that chrysalis, that pupae stage, into a butterfly is just amazing. It just blows your mind.
You think, how can this happen? I can't explain how it happens. Nobody can explain how it happens. They'll tell you in the first stage when it starts to hang there, they'll say, oh, hormones get excreted. That's true. The hormone levels of the caterpillar changes. But who tells the hormones to change? What tells the hormones to change? And how do they all know to do it at the same time? All those cells in that body know what to do. But they know what to do. It doesn't end up with a butterfly and a heap of gunk left over. Everything in that caterpillar turns into that butterfly. Only bit left is a translucent skin that gets broken. And the butterfly comes out fully formed. And you look inside that skin and there's nothing else left. If we could just have the next slide, please. And there it is, about 17 hours after it's come out. And you can see the little translucent skin above it. You probably can't. It's a bit, not a very good photo. But it's still clinging on to that little translucent skin. Everything in that butterfly turned into that, everything in that caterpillar turned into the butterfly. And I knew that as a little boy. I'd seen butterflies. I'd watched them. I'd fortunately pulled them apart, <laughs> had a look. <laughs> That's what little boys do. Have a look, see what, how it works. Didn't know how it worked. All I knew is that it went into a bit of a soup. And then after a while, if you left it long enough, you'd see it come out as a butterfly. And I'd say, amazing. But as I, as I looked at it through new eyes, through the eyes of the one who was saved, I saw it was the design and the work of God who created it as such. And it never happened by chance. You didn't get one, egg, one caterpillar trying to turn into a butterfly, but it didn't work, so... Doesn't even have any sexual organs. What happened to the caterpillar? It died. All the caterpillars died. Nothing would have, wouldn't have carried on. It started like that at day one. In day one, there had to be information in that caterpillar that would tell it that it could turn into a butterfly, yeah. and it had to be contained in the DNA of, and it is contained in the DNA of that caterpillar, and it starts to work, and it works in harmony to bring about something like that, and that's our God. And that's our creator. And if that didn't put, that put a nail through the coffin of evolution for me forevermore. So every time people tell me about the billions of years of the world and this happened and that happened, I say to myself, no, I know what the word of God says. The ones, the areas that I've looked into, I've found a satisfactory answer for me that it's God who created the butterfly. Not, not man, not evolution, no chance. Not a chance. So I just want to go back to who we are. Who are we? We're people who believe in our God. You know, you're kings and priests in the kingdom of God. That's who he's made us. And I want to encourage you as we talk about evangelism. You are equipped by God to go forth. He's given us the Holy Spirit. Peter and John, newly saved. Now, I know they were apostles, and I know they'd walked with Jesus, but so have you. And Jesus had given them the Holy Spirit, as he's given to you. And they were walking up to the temple one day, and they'd walked there many times before, and there was a man who was lame since birth sitting there. And they said to him, and he cried out, give me some money, give me some money, rattled his bowl, no doubt rattling it to everybody going past. Give me some money, give me some money, give me some money, please. And they came up to him and they stopped and they looked at him. He said, we don't have any money, we don't have any silver and gold, but what we have, we give unto you. And what did they have? They had the Holy Spirit. They had eternal life. That's what they had. They had nothing else to give. They didn't have any money. They didn't have anything else to give them. No food. He said, he said to the man, look at me, look at me. Look me in the eyes. And the man looked up and looked him in the eyes. And he reached forth his hand, Peter did, and said, oh, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, arise and walk. And the man rose up. Do you know what happened? They said, and the answer was in that, what we have we give unto you. And they ministered the Holy Spirit to that man. And how I know they ministered the Holy Spirit to that man, it was evidenced because his lame legs grew and he leapt up. But how I know they ministered the Holy Spirit is what he did next. He went into that temple praising God. And from his heart he praised God. From his heart that was changed because the Holy Spirit was now in his heart that he was praising God. 
they didn't give them a tract. And there's nothing wrong with tracts. But I just want to show you the, what God has for us. God has for us to minister your priests in his kingdom. And priests what? Priests minister God, but priests minister also out to people. And we're to minister. We're to minister what we have within us. That's why we need to go back to the intimacy with God. Because that intimacy with God you have in the Holy Spirit gives you the confidence to minister that out to your workmate, to your family, to your friend who's not saved. To minister that. We might minister it through word. We might minister it through deed. We might minister it as they did, holding their hand and praying and looking at them. And a transaction, a spiritual transaction occurred. And he received a spirit that he had never received before. It's what they had. And they gave it unto him. And he went leaping and dancing and praising God. Hallelujah. So as, as, as the team comes, please, and, uh, and, and, and just sings, as, leads a song. I want to encourage you this morning. We've been speaking about evangelism. I think I'm the fourth of the sixth week, and we've got two more weeks. It comes in our heart from our intimacy with God. It comes as we open up to believe that the power of God can work through us to others. And if I don't believe that, no matter what scriptures I shared, see, there's a difference between truth and life. Peter and John didn't come up to that man and said, Oh, what we'll give you is some truth. And they could have given them scriptures. They could have given them all the verses, all the, all the letters that Paul had written to the churches. Or had yet to write, but he, he could give, give them the scriptures. And they could have given them truth, but they never gave them truth. And truth is good. And they could have told them all things about God and God's plan of redemption. But they bypassed all that. They gave them life. They said, I have life inside of me and I give you life. And we too, and I too, must come to that place of knowing that I have the life of God within me to minister out, and he's chosen me and you for a time such as this. That in the middle of this nation, which looks worse and worse and worse each day we look upon it, God has chosen us to shed life. Us to share life. Now we might do it by speaking the scriptures, but life must go with it. It can't be dead scripture. It can't just be truth by itself. It must be truth and life. And it flows from us because each one of us who have been saved is a king and priest in his kingdom. Hallelujah. And the Holy Spirit will lead you and guide you and prompt you and give you the opportunities. And there's a great cloud of witnesses. The angels watching you, cheering you on, saying, go for it. You can do it. Because God can do it. Because God has had a son die that you might have life. And so that life from you might flow into the world. And so that the world might come to know him. For that's his desire. So as we sing this next song, I just want you to contemplate that in your heart. If anybody would like prayer to step forth and pray and, 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 and to step forth with a, 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 more, a greater surety of the life to flow from you, I'd be delighted to pray with you. But I urge you, seek God and find that truth. Find that truth in your heart, because until you find it in your heart, you'll never be able to share it to another person's heart. You'll never be able to share it to others. But Peter and John were so, so confident, that which we have within us, they said, we'll give unto you. I won't give you any money, but that which I have from God, which was given to me by Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit, he said, we'll give unto you. And then he took his hand and said, rise and walk, because that's the evidence of life being transmitted. And it was great evidence. And the man was just overjoyed. He was changed. Man, he was changed in his body. He was changed in his heart. And he cried and he just pro and preached praise to God. <laughs>